<laughs> uh, yeah, we're Michael and Andy. Um, we use he, him pronouns, both of us. Um, and we are really excited to be here. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the big ideas from, uh, from our book. And uh, Michael's gonna talk a little bit about, um, um, just kind of, kind of dig into one of the chapters and even have like a fun little, um, we're not gonna put you in, in groups, don't worry. <laughs> just a fun little kind of thought exercise. Uh, and after that, we'd love to love to take questions. Uh, if you think of questions, feel free to pop them in the chat, uh, and we can go through them at the end. Um, Michael will kind of monitor things while I'm talking, and I'll do the same while he's talking. So, so again, thank you so much. Really appreciate you having us. Um, we're super excited to be here. Um, and the the title of our book, the thesis of our book, is essentially that writing is a form of designing. And um, I think that if any of you um, you know, in your in your jobs as as UX practitioners, do any writing? You probably are familiar with this, um, but there are a lot of people who this is a revelation. A lot of product managers, a lot of uh, a lot of people at software and product companies, uh, for sure. So, um, what better way to sort of to sort of show like how important writing and words and language are to an interface um, than to talk about um, you know what happens when you when you take those words away? So. Um, you know, many of you, I, I'm not sure if this is up in, in Canada. Uh, did you, do you all have DoorDash? It's a food delivery app. Um, there's one of a million. There's many different kinds of, if not DoorDash, then I'm sure there's, there's plenty of others. Um, so this is an example from, uh, from DoorDash. Um, and like this is, this is a few of the screens, like an onboarding, like, like sign up screen, uh, a menu screen, and just sort of a checkout flow. So imagine what this would look like without words. It's uh, practically unusable, right? Like it's, you can still see that onboarding screen. You can see like a brand illustration. You can see a logo. You see that there's something, something like, you know, that you can, that you can scroll through there. That menu screen, like you can see, you can rate something maybe, and there's a more menu and there's a list, but like, who knows what that means? Who knows what's in there? Uh, and then that, that third screen, like you, you know, you can see that it's something to do with a map, right? Um, and you have some some options and a side by side thing, and then there's like a big button there at the bottom. But like, like what does this mean? How does this work? Um, it's a, it's just a good demonstration of like how inseparable um, words and um, layout and visual design are from each other uh, in order to like provide a good user experience. So really, when you're when you're writing those words, um, you really have to team up the writing and the design portion um, of your brains together uh, and just get them to work together. Uh, I'm going to give an example of kind of like how that looks in action here in a little bit, but um, this is very much like this isn't an original idea for us from us at all. Um, there's a really, really great author out there named Nicole Fenton. Um, she covered a book called Nicely Said, and uh, on her blog, she has this really great post called Words as Material, and I won't read this whole thing to you, but uh, one of the things she says is, you know, I don't write fiction or short stories. I use language to solve problems. And that is kind of the thesis of what a UX writer does, a uh, content designer, content, UX content strategist, you know, whatever you want to call it. Uh, that, is, that is what we do. The, the words person on the team uses language to solve problems. We'll dig into a few examples of that in action. So uh, if, if, like me, uh, you find yourself uh, thinking about the words on a UX design team, um, people would come to you and say, hey, Andy, I have this button. And this button completes a flow. Uh, what should we call it? Like, what should the words be? So uh, one side of my brain, the writer's side, starts uh, firing up and it says, well, okay, what are the right words for this button? Is it, is it done? Is it continue? Is it finish? Is it complete? Like, what's, what's the clearest, like, word that has the most meaning that, that I can use? But honestly, like, there's so many other questions, right? Like, the, the UX writer, like, the designer side of my brain fires up. And I have to like ask, like, what's the larger context? What are the entry and exit points? Um, what, imme what action immediately follows pressing this button, right? Like, is this, is this a completion flow? Is it gonna pull up a pop-up? Is it gonna like exit the app? What's going on here? Are we using the right messaging component in the first place? Should this be a button? Or should this be like an inline link? Or maybe it's an error message, or maybe it's, you know, something else. What's the inverse action of this button? Uh, if the button is, um, uh, finish, is it unfinish? Is it go back? Is it something else? Start over? Uh, how does it translate or localize, right? Like, does this, does this mean, does this make sense in uh, the, the 30 different languages that we translate, that we localize our app to? 
And of course, how does it fit within our voice and tone strategy? Like if you're a company like Adobe, do you want a button that says, you got it, dude? Probably not. Uh, that doesn't quite fit in that larger strategy. So all that to say that like, you know, we really have to have a larger context. People come all the time with just sort of a single component that says like, hey, what should the word be that goes here? And we have a million follow-up questions. We really have to see the bigger picture. Um, so in short, writing is about fitting words together. And designing is about solving problems for your users, at least in the definition that we like to use. Um, so really what we're doing is we're designing with words, uh, which is pretty much that big main thesis. Uh, a lot of you, if you went to HCI school or if you're familiar uh, for a while with, with UX, um, you're probably familiar with The Elements of User Experience, which is a book by Jesse James Garrett. And in that book, he has, um, I'm, this is a little bit of a paraphrase, but um, he has this really great um, sort of system for thinking, like framework for thinking about UX. And it's a bunch of layers that are stacked on top of each other. So you have this very abstract strategy layer, which is like, you know, the reason why we're, we're doing something or creating, or creating a thing. Um, there's the scoping layer where you're thinking about like timelines and roadmaps and MVPs and features sets and things like that. Um, you have this like system layer, right? Like uh, Jesse calls it uh, skeleton plus structure, um, but it's a system, right? Like how this is some rules about how something, uh, how the system behaves and how users interact with it. And then of course you have like the service layer, which is the actual like things that, you know, users interact with the Chrome. Um, and kind of along the way, you know, everybody has different deliverables, right? Like, so visual designers, capital D designers, um, you know, have things that they're working on. Content designers, people working on words and language and, and writing um, have the things that they're thinking about. Um, which is to say like, you know, like while designers are thinking about like, you know, the design strategy, content strategists are thinking about like you know, how to plan, create and manage content across the product, right? Um, hopefully everybody's working together just to scope to scope your project. Um, well, designers often are thinking about like, you know, component documentation and patterns and like design system stuff. Uh, typically the writers are thinking about style guide stuff, right? Like grammar mechanics and content patterns, how to structure an error message, terminology, stuff like that. Um, this is very broad strokes, by the way, this might be different at your company. Uh, and then finally on that surface level, um, well, designers are putting together wireframes and mocks, the screens. Uh, UX writers are thinking about specific microcopy, the buttons, the dialogues, the errors, et cetera. So uh, all this to say that like every step along the journey, uh, there is stuff for uh, kind of vis more visual people and more words oriented people to do. Sometimes those are, the, those are the same people. Sometimes they're different. Sometimes there are different people at every step along the journey. Uh, but generally that's how these disciplines kind of work together. So if words are such an important part of design, um, why do we sometimes think about design in terms of like the visual complicated tools we're using, right? Like Photoshop or Sketch or uh, Figma or Adobe XD or whatever, <laughs> you know, some things like that. Um, it's a, it's, there's a lot of complicated tools and a lot of uh, like language oriented people just like don't want to touch it. Or sometimes the designers don't want the writers in their tools. Um, but, but if you really think about this, like, when you're designing an interface for say a Google Home, like which of those tools should you use? Should you use Sketch? Should you use Figma? Or can you use a text editor, right? Like this is, this is a conversational interface. You're, you're writing dialogues and designing scripts and that's, that's the interface. Um, sometimes a text editor can, can be all you need just to kind of like wireframe to prototype your content, to prototype your, your interface. So all that to say is, you know, tools are great. They make our jobs easier. Um, they create uh, they create deliverables, but you can make um, a huge impact uh, even if you're using something like a like a text editor. So don't don't mistake making a del deliverable with making a difference, right? Like you can use you can use a whole multitude of these tools. And I work at a tool company. I work at a company that makes creative tools. So don't don't tell my boss. <laughs> um, so uh, so three big principles that I'm going to go through. Um, and give a couple examples of each uh, that we really think that your writing and the product should be. Um, we think that they should be use usable. We think they should be useful, which, you know, I'll kind of get into the differences between those two, those two words. Um, and then of course, responsible. So uh, let's focus on this first. Um, what is, what does usable mean? Uh, in short, it just means it helps users do stuff. So this is an example from my team's work at Adobe. Um, 
if, uh, if you're familiar with Adobe products, you may be familiar with the Creative Cloud mobile app, uh, which is a way to uh, you know, manage some of your, your uh, cloud documents, some of the shared work. There's tutorials in there. And on that tutorials page, um, at the bottom of the list of, uh, of tutorials, uh, we have a little prompt to tell people like, hey, you can use the search bar to find more tutorials if you don't see what you're looking for. So, you know, it used to say this, not finding what you're looking for, tap on the search icon next to your profile picture. So that was useful, right? Like it told you that you can use search um, to like, this is how you get into search to find what you're looking for. Um, but really at one point we just realized, you know, we can make this usable as well as useful and just shorten this. So we wrote it to use search to find more tutorials. Just really simple. We cut that length down by almost a third. Um, we harnessed the power of hyperlinks uh, to make that search word tappable to take you to a search experience. So uh, this, is, this is an example that I would usually pull out of showing how, how words can be, can be usable. Uh, and, and in short, you just, um, you have to find, find out if it's usable by figuring out if people can use the words that you've written, if you're prototyping it or user testing it or making it as accessible as possible. It's a really good book if anybody here is familiar with Content Design, which is a book by uh, Sarah Richards, who is pretty much invented the term content design and really kind of like solidified it and what it means today. Um, and if anybody's ever seen her talk, she's amazing. Uh, she, would be a, she would be a great guest if she's never been here, Paul. Um, she, she points out that if the words that you, are, that you write for something aren't accessible to everyone, you've made a design choice that prevents people from using that thing. So accessibility is super important. Um, it it uh, opens up your app. It does not dumb it down, your app, your experience, whatever. Um, so uh, moving on a little bit more, uh, talking a little bit more about this, we interviewed for our book a, a cognitive psychologist named uh, Dr. Melanie Pokolsky. And she conducted this huge uh, uh, study about um, customer service usability. And she found that one of the four most important usability factors in customer service for people out of 76 possibilities was uh, customer service behavior. Uh, and this is stuff that, um, that really like, you know, us as, as writers, as, as language experts can really craft and control. So things like the friendliness and politeness, as a, politeness of a system, uh, speaking pace and a, uh, the use of familiar terms in an interface is, is huge and makes a huge, uh, big difference in if your customer service uh, thing is a success. So of course, like, these are things you can control, right? Like friendliness and politeness, it has to do with, um, with your brand voice, with your, with your product voice. Uh, your speaking pace all, all often has to do with like, you know, the, the simplicity of the writing and, and the tone that you're choosing. And of course, use of familiar terms has a lot to do with terminology and taxonomies and things like that. So um, Dr. Polkowski um, kind of, talked more about that and said that, you know, human communication is the most important gift that we have, whether it's through speech or through writing. I really do think that human beings are worth fighting for, especially as technology overtakes more and more of what it means to be human. So if any of you have ever, ever sort of gotten stuck or gotten frustrated in an IVR, right, like in a phone tree, and the options really don't make any sense and you just want to do this thing, but it doesn't give you the right options, I think you, you know, um, you know where what she's talking about, right? Like you, you're getting just caught up in somebody else's idea of a taxonomy, or maybe somebody's org chart is getting in the way, for sure. Um, secondly, in addition to being usable, your writing should be useful. Um, and that seems like it should go without saying, but sometimes I'm just gonna go ahead and say it. Um, this is a really good idea of some, some experiences that are not particularly useful. Uh, if anybody here is familiar, and, and if anybody here works at the Grand Milia Hotels and Resorts, apologies. <laughs> um, when you are signing up and booking, uh, booking a hotel, uh, you might encounter this screen before you can get to the next flow. So let's look at the things that you're agreeing to here. So, so it says, yes, I went to register for the Milia Rewards Loyalty Program, and I have ex read and accepted their terms of service. Okay. Yes, I want to receive information about special offers and promotions from Malia and accept those conditions. Okay. If you do not want to receive commercial information, click here. So I'm agreeing with just that check mark to three different things, and one of them sort of conflicts with the, with the last one, with the previous one. Uh, but this, uh, there's this other one that says, I do not want to receive advertisements that you can click on to, to opt into optionally. So really, you can probably tell how this is happening, right? Like some product manager said, 
oh crap guys, we gotta be compliant with GDPR. How do we do that? Somebody says it's like, oh, let's just slap, I do not want to receive advertisements on it and get out of the door. So probably nobody did a whole lot of like cognitive walkthroughs or tests or something like this, something like that to, to really put this out there. So you end up with kind of like tacked on, bolted on experiences like this. Uh, an example of something that is useful. Um, if anybody here's ever read the Pinterest Terms of Service, uh, you might be familiar with this. Um, they, after each section of the Terms of Service, the legalese that, you, that you're reading, they have a section called More Simply Put that just describes in really plain language what it is that it's talking about or what you're agreeing to. So it's really useful in case you actually want to use it to like understand what it is you're agreeing to. Uh, what would have been more useful? Um, actually making the whole Terms of Service in this language. Um, but if anybody here has ever, you know, collaborated with the legal team, sometimes that is a uh, overwhelming prospect because, you know, their job is to uh, protect the company from liability. Your job is to get user understanding. Sometimes the command conflict. Sometimes uh, it works out really well. And I think this is a really good sort of compromise or, or feature. Um, so when you're making something useful, you really have to understand the purpose of a product uh, and the user needs. Uh, to make something useful. And oftentimes, uh, especially in UX teams uh, who don't have a strong writing practice, that happens way too late, right? Writers come at the end to fill a hole full of words. Um, and that is uh, that makes it really hard to understand purposes and to understand users' needs. We interviewed a really great designer and writer named Katie Lauer, based in Chicago. Um, she says, I feel like I always need the full context of what I'm solving for. So it's best for my work when I'm able to be in environments where I can get it. If you're joining a project at the very end and there's low tolerance for questions, it's a sign your role as a writer hasn't been well positioned or isn't well understood. So that's, that's huge, right? Like that's kind of like the, <laughs> the thing that, I mean, I've worked at Adobe, I have a team of eight and we've been doing this for years and it's sometimes we're still coming in at, like too late in a project. So last point I will talk about uh, before oops, kicking it over to Michael, um, is uh, responsible. And this is, this is, I think, something that like we, we owe to, uh, to all of our users and to the industry in general. Um, if anybody here uses LinkedIn, um, you're probably familiar with these like little canned responses at the bottom of messages. Uh, this is a real example that uh, Michael encountered with somebody after a, um, a colleague of his posted on LinkedIn that they were let go of their job. And Michael responded being the very kind person that he is. Um, Hi, I just saw your message on LinkedIn. I'm so sorry to hear what happened. If I can help in any way or connect you with someone, please let me know. Feel free to reach out. That person responded, hey, thanks a ton. I appreciate the support. I'm taking a couple of days to process everything. And we'll start the job hunt early next week. So, you know, Michael could have picked a few responses. He could have said, good luck, which like is, is great. Could have said, sounds good, which is very transactional and kind of down, down to the point. Uh, or he could have said, congratulations, which is just like patently false and uh, could actually harm his relationship with this user. Um, and, and while I'll, I'll agree, like not a lot of uh, UX writers probably have control over like the algorithmic logic that might, brings, uh, that might bring this up, um, they, uh, they sure do can uh, just have a good sort of like cognitive understanding of uh, the stress cases. And, raise a flag to the product team and say, hey, like I see this list of canned responses, something like congratulations, if it pulls up during like kind of a negative message, that's that's not a great idea. Um, I think we're all familiar with uh, Facebook experiences like that too. There was a uh, writer and web developer named Eric Meyer whose six-year-old daughter died and later uh, Facebook resurfaced a picture of her with a very celebratory tone and that was wholly inappropriate. Um, and which is a very similar kind of um, kind of situation to this, um, you know. And sometimes, sometimes being responsible just means thinking about how complicated things can be. Um, so, you know, a, a couple years ago, I was I got a Fitbit and I was filling out my um, my Fitbit um, profile, and you know, I was going through and putting my name and my birthday and demographic information and stuff like. Um, height and weight and stride and email or uh, calorie burning model, like that kind of stuff. And for me, uh, making this choice was really easy, right? Like I'm a cisgender male, I choose that, move on. Um, but we actually, uh, we actually interviewed a trans woman in our book. Uh, Ada Powers is her name. Uh, if anybody 
I was familiar with her on Twitter. She's a really prolific twit Twitterer. Um, she's really great. And um, we interviewed her for the book about how this, you know, for somebody like her, this is not such an easy choice. So I'm actually going to read you this quote. Um, it's kind of it's kind of long, but so so Power, Ada Power said, uh, "Now I want to get the most of my Fitbit, so I want to understand where they're coming from." Normally, I'd, I'd assume that Fitbit is awkwardly asking me about my gender, and I would just answer female for demographic reasons. Uh, but they also asked me for my height and my weight, so maybe they're looking for biological rather than demographic information. So should I answer male because of my supposed chromosomes, or should I answer female because the dominant sex hormone in my body is estrogen? But it's even more complicated than that. If I answer female, do they assume I'm interested in period tracking? What if I was a cisgender woman who doesn't have a uterus, or has one that doesn't function normatively. Do they use that information to assume hormone levels for their calorie burning models? And if so, what about people with polycystic ovarian syndrome, which can cause relatively high, higher levels of testosterone in the body? So uh, all this to say is it's probably the person who designed this was very much like me and thought this would be a very easy choice. Um, but really like, you know, could, could be thinking a little bit about like how, who else is using this product and not centering that around them? So uh, Ada also mentions, you know, if, if, if they were thinking about inclusivity, they'd understand that some questions don't have easy answers. By explaining what they want to know and why, it not only helps people on the margins like me, but anybody who may not be easily categorized and gets them to an even better quality information to act on. It's a win-win for the user and for the company. You know, in our workshop, we have an exercise, just mostly a thought exercise, where we take an example like this and we start applying it to other things. Right, like who else might have trouble answering this? Like somebody, somebody in like a certain situation or, you know, people who don't sort of like easily fit into the center of, of use cases. So, I mean, if you are asking this question and you need to know this information, um, what, what can you do? Um, and honestly, you should give context. You should be a little bit more upfront and straightforward. Um, if you're asking for this information, tell users why you're asking. This is from an onboarding flow for um, one medical in the US, which is a doctor's office, like a medical office. And it, it, this, this is a little wordy, um, but when they're asking for uh, sex, uh, they're specifically saying like, hey, please make sure that what you provide here is the same as what your insurance provider has on file. Usually the same as what your business's human resources has on file, because we here in America tie our insurance to our companies we work for, which is a bad idea, but that's a whole other <laughs> discussion. Um, and uh, they give the user ample opportunity to, um, to add extra context and to add information that seems relevant. Um, Natalie Yi, who is a um, very talented designer and someone we interviewed says, you know, we, we know that words can hurt people or we can help them in their personal lives. We can say re really reassuring words to people and it has this huge impact and we can say hurtful words and it has a years long impact, but we don't really treat the words we write in inter interfaces that way. Um, so last thing I'll, I'll do is leave you with this um, before I turn it over to Michael, but think about the idea of a newsfeed, right? Not even just, you know, your Facebook newsfeed, but, you know, Twitter, like, heck, like Adobe products have a newsfeed. Everything has a newsfeed. Um, we interviewed Jorge Arango, who is a information architect and author of a book called Living in Information. And he says that news is the feedback mechanism of our society. We vote based on the things we learn in the news. Very relevant to right now <laughs> here in the US. When we take a concept like that and we subvert it for commercial use, that's something that should give you as designers pause for sure. That's, uh, that's something to take very, take very seriously. So yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'll turn it over to Michael. Um, if I could stop sharing here, and we're going to talk a little bit about error messages and stress cases, and then we would love to take some questions. Cool. Thanks, Andy. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So as Andy said, we're going to talk about errors, uh, and then we're going to do a little activity at the end of this, and that'll be fun. So <clears throat> if you have questions, keep dropping them in the chat. Andy can get to them, or we can talk about them at the end. So errors and stress cases, what to do when things go wrong. <clears throat> First, let's talk about an error. What is an error? Um, let's align on a shared understanding. <clears throat> to me, we have to talk about errors separately from the messages that are involved in them. Um, sometimes people go directly to, okay, error message, um, without thinking, 
oh, you know, they're, they're, there's something causing this message in the first place. So let's think about some of the things that cause those messages. Here's a really unfortunate, true example from my career. Um, this, this happened uh, for a, a product that I was building and the dev team was uh, building the signup flow and I came into the office early one morning, it was like 7.30 uh, because we were working with a team in Northern Ireland. And so we had to do our standups really early in the morning. Um, I had not had my coffee yet in the literal sense and in the figurative sense. And um, the developer came over to me and said, um, okay, so we've got this birth date field and we need you to write an error message for when someone is more than a hundred years old. So here's what we've got. If someone enters their birth date and they're more than a hundred years old, then what we're going to say is please check the birth date and try again. And I was like, again, like still waking up, like I wasn't really with it, but I was like, why? why are we showing an error message if they're a hundred years old or more? Um, I, I don't get it. Like what's the need here? And uh, apparently there was an archaic security guideline um, that said, if you were building a, a system um, that integrated with this, uh, this platform, you had to uh, ask, um, you, you had to disqualify anyone who entered a birth date of a hundred years or more. So what's unfortunate about that is that there are literally thousands of people in the U.S. alone who are over 100 years of age. And if any one of them goes to this form and tries to enter their birth date and it just keeps telling them to try again, the form is essentially gaslighting them and just like trying to let them know, you're, you know, you need to check this, <laughs> even though it could be correct every single time. Um, so that what I did there was I started conversations with people throughout the company to try to figure out, uh, wh where is the security guard guideline coming from? Are you aware that you're um, alienating thousands of people um, by enforcing this? <clears throat> and that's how we had to go about it. So the, the developer who came to me thought this could be a very quick conversation, uh, maybe 10 minutes, and I could just approve what they had or write some, some small variation. And it ended up taking weeks to have these conversations with the security team. So I share that story to, to tell you that um, errors <clears throat> are more than messages. And sometimes the cause um, is, is murky. Sometimes the cause is um, you know, difficult or, or um, sometimes the cause will push people to the margins. And uh, it's always worth asking questions and it's always worth pushing on those things to change, even in very um, you know, seemingly simple situations. One other thing that I would encourage is to think in terms of stress cases and not edge cases. And this comes from the great book, um, Design for Real Life, that Andy mentioned just a few minutes ago. They, um, they talk about how edge cases as a term tends to kind of push people out. <clears throat> when you say edge cases, you're saying um, the people affected by that don't really matter. Um, and, and you're saying these are people we can choose not to care about. Uh, whereas stress cases emphasizes that people may be going through things our team is not considering right now and thinks through, you know, what can we do to help them? Um, so think about what your users are doing when you write errors. Here are some examples. You could have a highly stressed parent just trying to find the, the right medication for their child. You could have a newly engaged couple trying to figure out how to request a marriage license. You could have someone who um, is driving their car and they were in an accident and they're trying to schedule uh, repairs and pay for them. Or you could have a student trying to get their 3D model ready for class. But what is in common about all of these scenarios? In, in, none of, in every one of these scenarios, no one's goal is, I want to use software. I want to use an app. I want to um, <laughs> download something. That's not what they're trying to do. They're trying to accomplish something in their lives. And software is the mechanism to help them get there. So that's really important context when you're approaching errors because um, we need to stay focused on what people are trying to do and not so much on our software. Sometimes teams will say things like, well, if there's an error, that's because they're using it wrong, right? Um, I, I think it's a really harmful mentality to have. And I would encourage you on your teams that you're contributing to, to build this mentality that each error represents a moment where the needs of your users conflict with the needs of your system. And that makes them opportunities to make things better for your users. That actually makes them opportunities to help them move forward and accomplish more. Here's a quote from a book that I really recommend. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely related. This book is not about errors, but it's, it's super related. Um, 
this is uh, the book is badass. It's called Making Users Awesome. It's by Kathy Sierra. And uh, Kathy here is talking about what it takes to build software that people are recommending to each other. So she says, where you find sustained success driven by recommendations, you find badass users, smarter, more skillful, more powerful users, users who know more and can do more in ways that, that's personally, personally meaningful. So I think that's a great, great mentality to have when you're writing an error message. How can we make our users more awesome? How can we level them up? How can we help them accomplish more and get more done? So we have three principles that we go over in the book for error messages. And I just wanna walk you through them um, and give some examples to explain each one. Those principles are avoid, explain, and resolve. And uh, these are um, kind of driven by, by things that are really common in UX, like for example, the Nielsen Norman Group uh, heuristics um, for, for any digital system. Uh, but these three in particular, we wanna walk you through how they apply to writing these error messages. So uh, to just show you this, we're gonna use the scenario of someone depositing a check through an app. And this is a really common thing in the States at least. Uh, Bank of America um, in pre-COVID times was saying that more people use the check caching feature in their mobile app than, than they uh, deposited in local branches. So, so this is incredibly common. Um, and people are just taking these pieces of paper, taking pictures of them, and then it shows up in your bank account later. So, uh, I want to look at how Chase handles that and think through how they approached and applied the, the principles of avoid, explain, and resolve. So let's talk about avoid first. In the Chase mobile app, they um, actually disable the, the controls for moving on to the next part of the process if you don't enter an amount. So what this does is guide users toward uh, entering the amount before they can, they can do anything else, before they can take those photos, before they can deposit the amount. And um, this means they don't have to create an error for when someone tries to tap next, but they haven't entered an amount. You, you're, you're required to put it in. So they were able to avoid an error message entirely um, by doing that. <clears throat> and it kind of teaches people how to, how to go through this process. However, um, there are some caveats to this approach and what they did. One thing I would say is, um, you know, one thing I noticed right away is if you enter an amount and then take it out, you still have to have an error. So the error message still exists. It's just not seen by the majority of users. The other thing um, is that there can be some really serious accessibility concerns when you're disabling UI like this, because while a sighted user can see really easily that these buttons are not, um, that they're there, but they're not tappable, um, you, you really have to be careful with how you're coding it to make sure that that is obvious to um, non-sighted users as well. So it's important that something like this is run through accessibility testing. Next is explain. So if you have a great day and you get a $15,000 check and you try to deposit that in the Chase Mobile app, it'll tell you this is over your deposit limit. So the upshot is it tells you quickly and clearly what went wrong, that's great. Um, but it does leave some questions unanswered. So like, what do I do next? Can I take this to an ATM? or do I have to go to a branch? Um, you don't really know uh, what the next steps might be. So um, if you wanted to know why that deposit limit exists in the first place, it also doesn't really have a way to connect you with that information. Um, the way you can kind of get to the, the right answer for this situation is, is to test with real people and see what their concerns are as they see these messages. So um, one thing we talk about a lot in the book is that there's no one correct way to do anything. It's all about finding what's appropriate for your organization, for your product, and for your users. So I'm saying these things, and I'm not saying that this is good or bad. Um, I'm just saying that there are some good things here. There are some things that could go wrong. Um, testing and, um, and qualitative information will really help a team figure out what's appropriate. Finally, let's talk about resolve. So this is, uh, again, we're keeping our our mind on the scenario that the user is in. They didn't come here um, to use the Chase Bank auto capture feature when they're taking a picture of their check, right? They came here to deposit their check. So if Chase's auto capture doesn't work, you can retry that, that automatic feature or you can capture manually. And I love this approach because the team wasn't thinking, okay, we gotta make auto capture work. They were, they were thinking, okay, we gotta get these checks deposited. And they gave the user two ways to get out of it. And, and that's really great. 
um, that, that's a really positive approach to how you're, um, you're handling this. So that brings us to our activity. <clears throat> and we can do this in the chat. And we'll give, we'll give everybody about, um, I think we can do five minutes for this. So I've got a scenario here. And the scenario is that you are uh, involved in designing and building a sign-up flow for an online insurance company. And you know, there's a legal requirement that account holders have to be 18 or older. And you've been asked to handle the error state for when they're younger than 18. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the activity is actually, it doesn't involve writing the error message at all. Um, just write up some ideas for how the team could avoid, explain, or resolve this error. So um, we will take like five minutes for you to write this. You can write it on your computer. Um, and then when you're ready to share, just drop it in the chat. And we may uh, call on a few of you to share what you wrote and why. Any questions on this? OK, let's get going. I probably should have been singing the Jeopardy song. Andy, yeah, you missed While we're doing this. <laughs> oh, completely forgot. Sorry, everyone. I'm seeing some come in. This is great. If you get finished early, you can always watch for cats jumping around behind Andy. That happens a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I know. I'll give everybody a show. Yeah, this is Rupert. Hey, everybody. <laughs> All right, I'm really excited to hear about how Paul um, is hoping to accomplish his idea because it's really ambitious. <laughs> I like it. That's great. Insurance for babies. It's going to be big. It's going to be big. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> All right, let's do one more minute. If you've got any more ideas, please try to get them in the chat.
And Andy, would you mind calling on people? Um, because I'm I'm not able to see my mouse when I'm sharing yeah. my screen. So absolutely. Cool. We've got them all in. Um, I think we'll start calling on people just for the sake of time. Um, but feel free to add more if you if you bring any across. Um, so we may cool. just call on you to share. If you're not comfortable taking yourself off mute and sharing, but we'd also love to just hear if you want to provide any um, any explanation around why this was what you thought of. Yeah. Do, do you mind sharing what you have in here? And apologies if I'm pronouncing your name. Sure. No, you pronounced it right. You're the first person in the history of the world. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Uh, I don't remember what I said. Okay, I said a bunch of stuff. Um, so the basic one, uh, avoid not allowing any them to input any year, birth year, that is younger, that would yield younger than 18 years old. Yeah. So avoid yeah. error messages in general. And then I think I said, uh, uh, just as a result, Maybe if that's not enough, uh, tell the users to choose a different year within the allowed age limit like, and try again. So it's not just like a sort of open and shut case. Um, but I'm not sure how that would work with insurance. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. And, and okay. just be like very straightforward and say, you know what? Fuck the youth. You guys are not allowed. <laughs> the youth. <laughs> this is the wrong thing you're not allowed to do. <laughs> Damn that's you. really funny. In your bippity bop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I, I, the explanation thing you say like that, that's, um, we, we kind of all laughed about it, but sometimes companies are reluctant to, to say why they're, they're doing something. Um, and I, I really wish that trend would change <laughs> because it's so much more helpful for users. They're like, Oh yeah. Okay, fine. Like I, it's, I'm legally not allowed. Um, that's yeah, that's easy. Um, okay, cool. Thanks so much for sharing. Dua. Um, there's some really good good ones in here. Um, uh, Sama, I was wondering if you'd be willing to share yours. Um, there was, I think this is a really good, really good example. Sama El Sayed. Yeah. Sure. Cool. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I feel like a teacher. <laughs> Sama, <laughs> raise. Your... Sorry. Go on. Anyways, um, so to avoid. Um, there can be a checkbox option that asks users if they meet the age requirement, if they're 18 years or older. And um, the next step that I just wrote basically is like based on explain and resolve, I basically put them all together um, is I believe that you provide more information of why if they don't meet the requirements for more information about it and to resolve, uh, provide other like alternative product solution, the uh, products like if there's like a joint account that they can have with their parents or with their guardian, um, there are other product possibilities for them to explore as well. I Just love so this, yeah. Increasing. Insurance for kids. Insurance yeah. for kids. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but if you think about the, I love that, that your approach, uh, because if you think about it, this is going to make you a hero to your users and your, and your business, your employer, because exactly. it's not like the user, um, it's unlikely that the user is, is stupid and like simply coming to this insurance but company without needing insurance, right? They probably need it in some way. Um, so this is great because, um, you know, like a, a college student uh, who is maybe looking for renters, um, but is like 17, for example, or, you know, maybe a, um, you know, someone who's driving, they're 16, um, you know, in some states that's, that's legal, um, you know, maybe they, they need insurance <clears throat> and that's why they're coming. So working with the parent or guardian, that's a really great approach because you still get, you still make the sale um, you still get a customer. They still get what they were looking for when they came. Thanks so much for sharing. That's great. All right. I think we can do one more, Andy. Yeah. Does anybody want to volunteer? Any cool. interesting different approaches you see here? Volunteer time. Anyone? <laughs> cool. Um, yeah. Uh, I really wanted to hear about Paul's uh, lobbying effort and legislation yeah. that he's going to write. <laughs> Actually, I had another idea. You could we could get their age, and let's say they're two years uh, too young. You could 
set up a reminder to go market to them in two years. Hey, you're oh, yeah. finally 18. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. 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 absolutely. Happy birthday. That's a good one. That's really good. Cool. So thanks everyone for sharing. Um, this was uh, this was fun and I love always, um, like we do this a lot with different groups and I love hearing the different um, approaches. Real quick, does anyone have thoughts on like what it felt like to just think about avoiding explaining and resolving rather than jumping right into to writing a message? feel empowering did it feel, feel terrible did it feel terrible <laughs> i thought it was um really just a, a interesting way to look at things so instead of just saying okay just do whatever you want write this you know solution there's like just a sort of effective way of actually sort of compartmentalizing the solution and saying well well if you can take this action you know the resolve action or the avoid action so it was the specificity was really, really helpful, I thought. Cool, cool, yeah. cool. Yeah, it, what we're really trying to drive home with this is you're, th you're there not just to write the messages and the scenarios you're given. You're there to be a part of a cross-functional team and deliver a great experience to your users. So um, we hope that that's something you take into your work um, if you do this type of work. And I um, hope you're able to, to uh, you know, we hope it was helpful this this uh, exercise and, and if you're if you're if you lead a cross-functional team and you uh have writers on your team who are not fitting into this role please consider you know introducing them to the work a little bit more early yeah absolutely sure. absolutely yeah. if you have that power cool um so books are available at um writing is .com. Uh, you can also sign up for our newsletter there we recently um sold out a workshop about our book um, so we're really excited about that and we're going to announce another one soon. So if you're interested in taking that, um, please do sign up for the newsletter um, and we'll send out a, um, a newsletter when, when we have the next dates uh, set up for that one. Um, so thanks again for, for having us. Uh, we're really grateful to be here. I think we might have a few minutes for any outstanding questions. That, so, um, so let's dive into that. Yeah. Do a... Hi, um, thank you so much for this. This was amazing, um, dream come true. My question is actually, are, will either one of you be attending the Button Conference that's coming up next week? Yes. Oh, yes, indeed. We are yeah. deeply involved. <laughs> uh, Michael's, Michael's given a talk about um, chatbots and how to write for chatbots to make them useful and accomplish things. Um, I am a slacker and I will be on some panels. I don't have any talks to give. So I'll be on a, I think we're both on a panel about, um, about UX books, like, a, like an author book club panel. And then um, I'm on one about design leadership. So I think I'm hosting a small group discussion too. Are you doing one of those, Michael? Yes, I am about UX yeah. writing. Nice, yeah. So Very excited about Button. We'll be, we'll be all over the place there. Yeah, awesome. Gonna, I'll yeah, see you guys be... there. I'm, I'm yeah. a huge fan of both of yours. So, right oh, so thank you. Yeah. Looking forward to seeing you there. Uh, if anybody here is uh, looking for a really good UX writing conference and uh, has some maybe professional development money to spend, uh, next week is the Button Conference. And it is by the same people who make Confab, uh, the Brain Traffic team, which is a really great content strategy conference. So, uh, there's going to be really good speakers. Um, I'm really looking forward to. Uh, to a colleague of ours, uh, Sophie Tehran is the UX writer at Condé Nast Magazine, and she's going to talk about like adapting the New Yorker voice to uh, to digital experiences, which I think is just fascinating. So lots lots of good lots of good stuff there. That's just the one that came off the top of my head. Yeah. Good. Uh, we had a Thanks. question from Tony. Um, Tony, do you want to ask it, or do you like ask it out loud, or do you want me to just read it? Whatever you prefer. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, it's um, being up in Canada and designing interfaces uh, and apps here. Um, it's basically a legal requirement when we're uh, designing interfaces to ensure that it includes both English and French for all of our services. And um, I know uh, I have to spend a lot of time with um, thinking about that interface in advance and the amount of screen uh, uh, real estates required um, because oftentimes speaking English first, uh, I think of that and then I realize, oh, that button or that link or et cetera, we need to have a little bit more space. 
any strategies about that when you're thinking about localization and broader than English and French, but that's my context. Yeah, I think just, um, just rule of thumb in general, like we try to give, uh, make sure that like a string can expand by at least 30% in order to fill a space. Norwegian and German is like typically the longest languages that Adobe, uh, Adobe products translate into. Um, but I mean, the trouble with that is it's very much like assuming kind of like a right to left, um, like horizontal space, right? There, there's so many languages that go left to right or uh, up and down or just like don't kind of like fit in that reading pattern anyway. So it's, I think it's, I think it's important to have like a robust kind of like localization team instead of just a translation team, um, which I think is, yeah, is, is something that we're definitely grappling with, grappling with Adobe, which has a very big built out kind of like translation team, um, trying to make that make that better. So yeah, this is this is something we're absolutely grappling with right now is make it not so it's just because you know, we truncate some buttons and words for ex like for like small screens and just in languages it's a kind of a poor experience. So yeah, thinking through thinking it through not as just like translating strings but it's just like you know, translating the whole system. Okay. Yeah, and you know, um I would recommend uh following some folks in the EU. Uh UX writing community. Mario Ferrer is one that I think of right away. Um, also, um, I, I can send, a, I, I can, if you connect with me on LinkedIn, I can send a few more um, that I'm not, uh, not on the top of my head. But um, Mario uh, is a, a community builder in the EU scene, and they talk a lot about how trans localization is UX writing, right? Like there's so yeah. much that goes into it, and it's, it's really critical. Um, so they have a lot of practices they've developed. Great. Thanks again. Yeah. Yeah, Dua, you had a, yeah, just posted a really good, really good question. How much UX design do you feel writers should know, if at all? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a question I think a lot of people talk about. And I, I think it's okay to come on the scene without much UX design experience, but I think it's something that's important to pick up along the way, right? Like sometimes, sometimes you're, you are putting words directly into a Figma document, or sometimes you are in a crit with uh, designers and like you're talking about affordances or flows or things like that. Like it's, it isn't like you wanna, you wanna feel comfortable kind of navigating outside your lane. And I think a lot of that comes from just having like, like being a strong systems thinker, like is kind of something that's important for UX writers for sure. And um, being able to sort of like, there's, there's definitely UX designy things that I just do not care about, like modals versus page flips versus layers. Like, I don't care about that, like sort of like spatial flow, <laughs> but I know that people do. And, but in general, I think that like, it's good to have just kind of an understanding of a lot of that. Right. What do you think, Michael? Yeah. Well, um, yeah, can you actually say a little bit more about what you mean by UX design? Yeah. Like, are you thinking of anything in particular? Uh, me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um. Just because I've worked with alongside UX designers, and like, I have no idea what it is they do. I just tell them what to do <laughs> and mm, where to like yeah. place everything. But as far as the actual tooling, um, I know nothing. Yeah, so I think like if you're working, the tools are one thing. It's great to be able to be proficient in whatever design tools they're using. Um, they will change every two years probably. But you know, it's still really important to be able to collaborate in that space. But I would say what's more important for writers is to think of like what they can learn and apply from the UX craft. So things like facilitation, design thinking, research, testing, those are all really critical things for a, a writer to feel really comfortable with. Um, so I'd say like the craft itself <clears throat> and everything that goes into it, um, it's, to me, it's more important than like um, the, t the tool set that, that people are using. Maybe a last question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, um, Grace, do you, wanna, do you wanna ask your, your question? It's, it's really great. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Perfect. Um, so I'm newer to UX. I have a background in human factors actually. So I've sort of been thrown into this idea of designing specifically in mixed reality. 
And I know that we definitely struggle as a team right now on this idea of errors and warnings that are going to be popping up and how to really write for those because our scenarios are very much like high stress environments. And so I just didn't know if anyone had some recommendations on readings or tips. Yeah. Um, there's a really great, um, really great content strategist at uh, Oculus named Andrea Zeller. Um, I'll post a link to her. Um, she has a medium post that just has some like really good tips for content strategists who are designing for VR. Um, she is immediately who I think about when I think about um, like designing for VR experiences. Um, so I'll post a link to that in the chat. Um, I, I honestly, I've never worked on a VR or a, like AR, MR experience. Um, have you, Michael? No, no, I haven't. But I was going to mention like one field that seems really relevant if it's like for, if the VR is immersive is uh, voice design. Um, mm -hmm. So things like Kathy Pearl's book, um, designing voice user interfaces, those would be really helpful for thinking through how to write dialogue um, that someone might hear during one of those experiences. Um, but yeah, I, um, I'm grateful that you, that you had a link, Andy, because yeah. I, I don't have a lot of experience in that area personally. Perfect. Yeah, she's, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Andrea's great. She's definitely someone to kind of like follow and keep an eye on. Yeah. All right. Um, we good, Paul? Any, yeah. Anything yeah. else? Yeah, no, I think uh, it's a good good point to segue into our next uh, segment here. So first, I uh, want to thank you very much for a great talk. And there's a lot of good questions. And it sounds like you guys are have a lot of great references to people and books and whatnot. So it's a, a great. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah. And we could skip the whole talk and we could just ask you, hey, who's a good person for this? Or what's a good <laughs> book for that? Yeah. <laughs> Give us all your, all your leads. Yeah. So I want to thank you very much for that. So as uh, people uh, who are regular members of Torque, I know it, at this point, what we do is uh, anybody who wants to stick around can stick around and we have more of a, you know, informal networking chat. And I know uh, Michael's got to run off, but I think Andy could stay a while, but just, you know, we can just chat about, about anything that's on people's minds. And so I'll give people uh, a few minutes, uh, you know, people who want to leave, now, now would be a good time. So we'll give people a moment to leave and then anyone who's left, we can just have a little chat. And at this point, I will uh, end the recording as well. So good. So if you're leaving us now, thanks very much for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. And thanks again to our presenters. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thanks everybody. for having us. See you around. Thank you. Yeah.